Okay, devotees, welcome to day 69 of our Bhakti Vai Bhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto. And we, devotees, we now are entering the 25th chapter. There's 33 chapters in the third canto, so we are progressing at least. We are progressing. Right, so let's have a look through here. First of all, though, let's chant our prayers. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shamati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane, Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastichade Shatarane, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivasari Gaura Bhakti Brinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vanchikalpa Trubius Chakri Pasindubya Evacha, Paditanam Pavanebio Vaishnavebio Namo Nama. All right, so Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 25, is titled The Glories of Devotional Service. And here, there are 44 verses. We have divided them into five sections as follows. First section is from verse 1 to verse 3. So it's a short introductory section. Verse 1 to verse 3, it is titled, Shonaka asks ask Sutta to describe more about Lord Kapila. Mm -hmm. Shonaka asks Sutta to describe more about Lord Kapila, verse 1 to verse 3. Second section is verse 4 to verse 11. Maitreya explains how Devahuti started questioning Kapila. Yes, because Kapila is going to instruct Devahuti. Oh yes, a lot of instructions. Verse 4 to verse 11, Maitreya explains how Devahuti started questioning Kapila. Third section is from verse 12 to verse 27. Kapila replies to Devahuti. And fourth section Verse 28 to verse 30, Devahuti questions Lord Kapila further. Verse 28 to verse 30, Devahuti questions Lord Kapila further. And then the fifth section, verse 31 to verse 44, Kapila responds further. 31 to 44, Kapila responds to Devahuti further. Right, so here we go, devotees. First section, verse 1 to verse 3. Shonaka asks Sutta to describe more about Lord Kapila. So we'll just read straight through these three verses. We won't read the verses first and then come back and do them again with the purports. Verse 1. Sri Shonaka said, Although he is unborn, the Supreme Personality of Godhead took birth as Kapila Muni by his internal potency. He descended to disseminate transcendental knowledge for the benefit of of the whole human race. So, all right. Now, let's go through the purport. And Prabhupada begins the purport by saying, Atma Pragyaptaye, which is in the last verse of the, I mean, the last line of the verse. 
Atma Pragyaptaye indicates the Lord descends to disseminate uh, or for the benefit of hum humanity to give transcendental knowledge because uh, transcendental knowledge because the thing is material necessities they're quite sufficiently provided for explained in in the Vedas within Vedic knowledge all sorts of explanations are there how to improve yourself materially and and particularly how to come to the level of goodness because in the level on the level of goodness knowledge expands this is a material mode of goodness in the mode of passion there's no real knowledge it's there's just an impetus to enjoy and in the mode of ignorance there's no knowledge it's no knowledge, which there was in goodness, and there's no, no there's no enjoyment, which there was at least you know to some degree, in passion. So basically, in ignorance, life is just like the animals. So then we have a second paragraph here, that the Ve the Vedas are meant to bring us to elevate us. Yes. First of all, from ignorance to goodness. And then once you've come to goodness, then you can understand knowledge of the, the self, transcendental knowledge. At least the possibility is there. But otherwise, just an ordinary man can't, can't understand all of this. Therefore, well, what is Prabhupada, how does Prabhupada put it here? Therefore, since a disciplic succession is required, this knowledge is expounded either by the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself or by his bona fide devotee. Yeah, so, I mean, that's sort of like a given that disciplic, disciplic succession is required. If there's no disciplic succession, it will not work. Yes. Right, so, Shonaka says here then, Kapila came simply to disseminate transcendental knowledge. Appreciate, disseminate. But, but simply to understand that we're not matter, but we're spirit soul isn't sufficient for understanding really understanding the self and the activities of the self. You have to become situated in activities of Brahman. This is explained by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, humans can understand, not animals, not animals. Nrinam, the term Nrinam is there, means it's for human beings. And humans are meant to live regulated lives. Al animals, they can also live regulated lives. I mean, there is regulation to some degree, but not in the Shastric sense. Not in the Shastric sense. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Human life is regulated life, not animal life. In regulated life, in regulated life only, can one understand transcendental knowledge. Verse 2. Shonaka continued, There is no one who knows more than the Lord himself. No one is more worshipable or more mature a yogi than he. He is therefore the master of the Vedas, and to hear about him always is the actual pleasure of the senses. Okay, so there's a fair, quite substantial purport here. So in Bhagavad Gita, of course, it says no one's equal to or greater than the Lord. The, the Vedas explain that. 
the Lord, we just read actually the Lord, I mean yesterday, though I think it was yesterday, the Lord is known as Asa Mordva, which specifically means no one's equal to or greater than him. So yeah, so all, all other living entities are subordinate to him, including the Vishnu Tattva, and of course the Jiva Tattva, Tattva obviously, but even the Vishnu Tattva is under Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this verse confirms that Nahyasya Varshmana Pumsam, amongst the living entities, no one can surpass the Supreme Person because no one is richer, more famous, stronger, more beautiful, wiser, or more renounced than he. These qualifications make him the Supreme Godhead, the cause of all causes. Second paragraph. So anyone who's associated with the Lord is a first class yogi. Of course, the devotees may not be, they usually definitely not, as powerful as the Lord. But by constant association with him, they become as good as him. And if he really empowers them, well, let's, Prabhupada says, he concludes the purport, sometimes the devotees act more powerfully than the Lord. Of course, that is the Lord's concession. In other words, the Lord may facilitate them to act even more wonderfully than him. Although generally, they're certainly not as powerful as him. And the third paragraph, the word varimna means most worshipful of all yogis. Uh, to hear from Krishna is the greatest pleasure. Therefore, he's known as Govinda because by his words, teachings, instructions, pastimes, qualities, he enlivens the senses. That's Govinda. He, he gives pleasure to the senses. So all his instructions, they're from the transcendental level. And therefore they're non-different from him, being absolute. So Prabhupada makes the point, the more we read Bhagavad Gita, the nicer it becomes. And the more enlightenment comes, same with Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the more we hear and chant the glories of the Lord, the more we become happy. Okay, on to verse 3. Therefore, please precisely describe all the activities and pastimes of the personality of Godhead, who is full of self-desire, and who assumes all these activities by his internal potency. So here in the purport, Prabhupada says that the word Anukirtaya is very significant. It's the last word and the last line. And well, there it's translated as please describe. But Prabhupada says, Anukirtaya means to follow the description, not to create a concocted mental description, but to follow. So Shonaka has asked Sutta to describe what he had heard from his spiritual master, Shukadev Goswami, about the pastimes of the Lord by the Lord's internal potency. Yeah. Following the description not creating, not concocting a description. And, and of course, the Lord, the Lord has no material body, but can assume any body he likes by the internal energy. So on we go, devotees, to the second section, verse 4 to verse 11. Maitreya explains how Devahuti started questioning Kapila. Right, so let's read through the verses. Sri Sutta Goswami said, 
The most powerful sage, Maitreya, was a friend of Vyasadeva. Being encouraged and pleased by Vidura's inquiry about transcendental knowledge, Maitreya spoke as follows. Verse 5, Maitreya said, When Kardama left for the forest, Lord Kapila stayed on, stayed on the strand of the Bindu Sarova to please his mother Devahuti. So he stayed on the strand means on the beach, basically, or on the bank, something like that, of Bindu Sarova, because that's where, that's where Karadama had been living, on the banks of Bindu Sarova. So Lord Kapila stayed on to please his mother Devahuti. Verse 6, when Kapila, who could show her the ultimate goal of the absolute truth, was sitting leisurely before her, Devahuti remembered the words Brahma had spoken to her, and she therefore began to question Kapila as follows. Devahuti said, I am very sick of the disturbance caused by my material senses, because for, for because of the sense disturbance, my Lord, I have fallen into the abyss of ignorance like deep into ignorance. Verse 8, Your Lordship is my only means of getting out of this darkest region of ignorance, because you are my transcendental I, which by your mercy only I've attained after many, many births. Verse 9, You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the origin and supreme lord of all living entities. You have arisen to disseminate the rays of the sun in order to dissipate the darkness of the ignorance of the universe. Verse 10. Now be pleased, my lord, to dispel my great delusion. Due to my feeling of false ego, I've been engaged by your maya, and have identified myself with the body and consequent bodily relations. Verse 11, Devahuti continued, I have taken shelter of your lotus feet because you are the only person of whom to take shelter. You are the axe which can cut the tree of material existence. I therefore offer my obeisances unto you who are the greatest of all transcendentalists, and I, I, and I inquire from you as to the relationship between man and woman, and between spirit and matter. Uh, right, okay, so that's that section. The verses, let's go through in detail, verse 4. Well, she, it, it's the, the title is She Begins Questioning Kapila, it's verse 4 to verse 11. Verse 4, Sri Sutta Goswami said, The most powerful sage Maitreya was a friend of Vyasadeva. Being encouraged and pleased by Vidura's inquiry about transcendental knowledge, Maitreya spoke as follows. So, this is, this is very nice. It's very nice. Uh, it's a very straightforward point, but it's well worthy of repetition. That questions and answers are, are, are good. They're satisfactorily dealt with when the inquirer and the speaker are both bona fide. They're both authorized. So here, Maitreya, it's interesting, he's addressed as Bhagavan because he's considered such a, a powerful sage. It can be used, it can, it's generally, Bhagavan is generally used for the Lord by, by far the most. But it is also used for anyone like particularly a great devotee who's almost as powerful as the Lord like Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, Shukadev, and here Maitreya. They're uh, addressed as Bhagavan. So Maitreya, in the case of Maitreya, of course, he's very spiritually advanced. 
personal friend of Vyasadeva, who's also addressed as Bhagavan sometimes. So Maitreya was pleased with Vidura's inquiries because they were the inquiries of a bona fide advanced devotee. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, when there are discourses on transcendental topics between devotees of equal mentality, the questions and answers are very fruitful and encouraging. Verse 5, Maitreya said, When Kardama left for the forest, Lord Kapila stayed on the strand of the Bindu Sarova to please his mother, Devahuti. So, yeah, let's have a look at the purport. So, of course, as we know, in the absence of the father, the grown son or the eldest, the grown sons, and particularly the eldest son, in this case there's only one, must take charge of the mother and serve her nicely so she doesn't feel separation from her husband. Whereas on the other hand, the duty of the husband is to leave home as soon as there's a grown son who's capable of taking charge. That's the Vedic system. And, and otherwise, you definitely shouldn't remain implicated in family life until death. Prabhupada says, concludes the purport by saying, family affairs and the wife may be taken charge of by a grown son. Verse 6. When Kapila, who could show her the ultimate goal of the absolute truth, was sitting leisurely before her, Devahuti remembered, remembered the words Brahma, Brahma had spoken to her, and she therefore began to question Kapila as follows. There is no purport to this verse. So we go on to verse 17. And verse 7, Devahuti said, I am very sick of the disturbance caused by my material senses. For because of the sense disturbance, my Lord, I've fallen into the abyss of ignorance. Abyss. Whoa means like a very deep, what would you call it, crevasse sort of thing, or just falling over the edge like a cliff can be an abyss. So this is the abyss of ignorance. So, okay, in the purport, Prabhupada says, the word Asad Indriya Tarshanat is significant. That's in the second line of the verse itself. And how's it translated here? Impermanent agitation of the senses. So Prabhupada explains, asat means imper impermanent or temporary. And indriya, of course, means senses. So thus asad indriya tarshanat means from being agitated by the temporarily manifest senses of the material body. So anyway, we are evolving through different bodies, even in this body from childhood to youth, now into old age. But otherwise, in a broader sense, sometimes humans, sometimes animal. So our activities are changing. And we should know that beyond these temporary very specific senses, specific to the particular body we have, be it human or male human or female human or some form of animal. There's so many forms of animals. Each animal has their particular senses. So beyond these temporary senses of the particular body we're in now are our permanent senses but they're covered by the material body. So, therefore, the permanent senses, they're not working properly. They're working improperly because they're covered over. 
yeah, and the temporary senses of the current body, they're just dominating the situation. So devotional service means to free the this, this senses from this contamination. And when the contamination is removed and senses are acting in pure Krishna consciousness, then we've reached sad indriya. Sad indriya. In the verse it talks of asat indriya, the impermanent senses, but now we're talking about sad indriya, the permanent senses. And and the, with the when we've reached sad indriya, then we've reached eternal sensory activities. So these activities, they are devotional service. Whereas the temporary activities of the temporary senses of the particular body, they are just sense, sense gratification. So unless we become tired of sense gratification, we're not going to be able to really hear the transcendental messages from people like Kapila. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll pick up something, but to become absorbed, that's another thing. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Devahuti expressed that she was tired. Now that her husband had left home, she wanted to get relief by hearing the instructions of Lord Kapila. Verse 8. Your, your Lordship is my only means of getting out of this darkest region of ignorance because you are my transcendental eye, which by your mercy only I've attained after many, many births. So, gosh, this verse is very instructive, isn't it? Um, because it indicates, Prabhupada says, the relationship between the spiritual master and the disciple. As conditioned souls, we're in the darkest region of ignorance, entangled in sense gratification. But if we get a spiritual master like Kapila or his representative, then by the grace of the spiritual master, one can be delivered because the spiritual master gives those instructions which arouse the eternal permanent senses. Yes, instructions in engagement in devotional service and avoidance of material life. So therefore the spiritual master is worshipped as one who de delivers the disciple from ignorance with the torch of knowledge. And Prabhupada, in the sort of middle of the purport, says that the word paragam is significant it, because it refers to one who can take the disciple to the other side. And the spiritual master does this with knowledge. Yes, opening the eyes with knowledge. Otherwise, we're struggling here in ignorance. But now the disciple can go to the other side. So, to the side of freedom. So in Bhagavad Gita, of course, it says, after many, many births, one may surrender to the Lord. That's chapter 7, verse 19. Similarly, after many, many births, one may be able to find a bona fide spiritual master and surrender to him, bona fide representative of Krishna. And then one can be taken to the side of light. It's really nice. Verse 9. You are the supreme personality of Godhead, the origin and supreme Lord of all living entities. You have arisen to disseminate the rays of the sun in order to dissipate the darkness of the ignorance of the universe. So, okay, yes. Um, Bhagavan Pumsam. 
the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord of all, the origin of all living entities. That's how Devahuti is accepting him. The word Adya, Adya meaning origin first, the origin. It means the origin of all living entities and Pumsam Ishvara means the Lord of all living entities. So Lord Kapila, who is Lord Kapila? He's a direct expansion of Krishna. And Krishna is the son of spiritual knowledge. So as, as the sun dissipates the darkness of the universe, means when the morning comes, when the light of the Supreme Lord comes down, it immediately dissipates the darkness of Maya, not just the darkness of the material world, so you can see the material world nicely, but the dance and darkness of illusion. So Prabhupada makes the point, we have eyes, but without the light of the sun, our eyes are useless. And he concludes the purport by saying, similarly, without the light of the Supreme Lord, or without the divine grace of the spiritual master, one cannot see things as they are. Verse 10, now be pleased, my Lord, to dispel my great illusion. Due to my feeling of false ego, I've been engaged by your maya and have identified myself with the body and consequent bodily relations. Well, that's a classic situation, isn't it? So Prabhupada gives an extensive purport. So first point, the false ego of identifying the body with what, as oneself and claiming things related to this body as belonging to oneself. Prabhupada says, this is called Maya. And Prabhupada refers to Bhagavad Gita 1515, in which of course, I mean, we've come across it a number of times and I'm sure you all know the verse. It says the Lord, the Lord says, I'm sitting, in every, I'm sitting in everyone's heart and from me come everyone's remembrance and forgetfulness. So Devahuti is, has, is saying that this false identification of the body with the self and the, then the attachment for the possessions related to the body it's also under the uh, direction of the Lord, Hare Krishna. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? So what does this mean? Prabhupada says, does this mean that the Lord discriminates by engaging one in his devotional service and another in sense gratification? If it were true, it would be an incongruity on the part of the Supreme Lord means that if it's true that the Lord just um, just discriminates, you, you engage in devotional service and you, oh, you just go to sense gratification. That would be unfair, incongruous, not, not reasonable. But that is not the actual fact, Prabhupada says. As soon as the living entity forgets his real constitutional position of being the eternal servant and wants to join in sense gratification, then he is captured by Maya. Captured by Maya. As soon as we forget our position of eternal servitorship to the Lord, and start wanting to enjoy sense gratification, we're captured by Maya. And this capture, what, what is this capture? Um, the capture is, the capture by Maya is the consciousness of false identification with the body and attachment for the possessions of the body. So these are the activities of Maya. And since Maya is 
an agent of the law. It's indirectly the action of the law. But it's not a question of favoritism or aggression on his part, like giving us, giving us a hard time unreasonably. So Prabhupada says, Prabhupada explains further, the Lord is merciful. So if someone wants to forget him and enjoy here, he gives facility. Not directly, but through the agency of the material energy. Yes. So seeing it's the Lord's potency, indirectly it's the Lord facilitating our forgetfulness. Therefore, Devahuti is saying, my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you. <laughs> now kindly get me free from this entanglement. My Lord, isn't that just an interesting way to put things. So in the next paragraph, by the grace of the Lord, we enjoy in this world. But when we become frustrated, we sincerely surrender and he kindly frees us from our entanglements. I think that's what he's doing with me, ha having, I mean, at least giving me the opportunity, engaging me so much in Srimad Bhagavatam. Phew, it's overwhelming. So therefore in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, first you surrender, then I'll free you. Yeah. So, yeah, free you from all reactions of sinful activity. So what is this sinful activity? Its activity is performed in forgetfulness of our relationship with the Lord. Any, any activities which are in forgetfulness of our relationship with the Lord, that's sinful. So therefore, materially pious activities are also sinful. How's that? Yes, they're also sinful. Pious material activities just done in and of themselves to help people with no connection with the Lord in the, in the consciousness. So for example, Prabhupada gives an example. Uh, one may, a person may give some charity with the view to getting more in return. This is charity in the mode of passion. So this is sinful. It's not service to the Lord. So because of sinful activities, we become attracted by the illusion of material attachment and think where the, these bodies and the possessions of these bodies are ours. So Prabhupada then concludes the purport by saying, Devahuti requested Lord Kapila to free her from that entanglement of false identification and false possessions. Right, so verse 11. Devahuti continued, I have taken shelter of your lotus feet because you are the only person of whom to take shelter. You are the axe which can cut the tree of material existence. I therefore offer my obeisances unto you, who are the greatest of all transcendentalists, and I inquire from you as to the relationship between man and woman and between spirit and matter. Right, so there are a couple of paragraphs of purport, fairly substantial. So Sankhya deals with Prakriti and Purusha. Prakriti is the Lord, or it can be applied to anyone who imitates the Lord as an enjoyer. Uh, Puru, sorry, Purusha. Purusha is the Lord. Purusha is the Lord, or anyone who imitates the Lord as an enjoyer. And Prakriti means nature. So in this world, Prakriti uh, 
is being exploited by Purusha. Yes, the living entities, that's us. Yeah. So the intricacies of, in this material world, of the relationship between Prakriti and Purusha, the, the, the living entities and the material nature, the enjoyed and the enjoyer, it's, it's complicated. So this is called samsara or material entanglement. So Devahuti wants to cut that tree of entanglement and she has found the weapon in Kapila. So interesting point, the tree of material existence is described in Bhagavad Gita 15th chapter right in the beginning as being, uh, as being a, a banyan tree with its roots up and branches down. That's the tree of material life. It's a banyan tree with its roots up and branches down. Where, where do you find a tree with its roots up and its branches down? Where do you find such a tree? Well, you only find it on the bank of some body of water in the reflection of the, the actual banyan tree which is standing next to the water. And there you have it. So, so one has to cut the root of that tree of Maya with the axe of detachment. So what is that? Prabhupada asks, what is that attachment? Well, it involves Prakriti and Purusha. The living entities, Purusha, in this context, are trying to lord it over material nature, Prakriti. Yes. So, Prabhupada concludes the first paragraph to, by saying, since conditioned souls take material nature to be the object of their enjoyment and take the position of the enjoyer, Therefore, they're called Purusha for, for these purposes. Second paragraph, Devahuti. So Devahuti is questioning Kapila because she knows he's the only one who can help her cut her attachments to this world because he's the Supreme Lord. Otherwise, all the living entities are trying to enjoy both men and women as if they're all Purushas. But actually, the Lord is truly speaking the Purusha. Everyone else is Prakriti. In material life, men and women are imitating Purushas, trying to be, but they can't really be in the proper sense of the term. So, yeah, so this is the cause of samsara bandha. This is the cause of samsara bandha, or conditioned life. Yes, she wants to get out of it. David Hoodie wants to get out of it and surrender. And the Lord is sharanya. This is in the first line of the verse. The Lord is Sharanya, which means the only worthy person, personality to whom one can fully surrender. Yes. So if anyone wants relief from this world, from the material world, they should surrender to the Lord. Lord Sharanya. Lord. Yeah. Well, anyway, it could be a name of the Lord, actually. But the Lord is Sharanya. Yeah, he's the shelter. So anyway, uh, the Lord is described as Saddharma Vidam Varishtam, which Prabhupada says indicates that of all transcendental occupations, the best is loving service to the Lord. So Prabhupada then goes into a little 
discussion about the term dharma. Dharma sometimes translators, uh, translated as religion, but it's not exactly 100% correct. It actually means that which cannot be given up, that which is like intrinsic to you or intrinsic to whatever the thing is. Uh, like Prabhupada says, the warmth of fire is inseparable for, from fire. So warmth is the dharma of fire. It's inseparable. It, it is what it, the fire is. So sad dharma then, eternal dharma, means eternal occupation. And that is transcendental service to the Lord. So therefore the purpose of Kapila's Sankhya philosophy is to propagate pure devotional service. So therefore he's addressed here as the most important person among those who know the transcendental occupation of the living entity. Sure, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? So devotees, now we go on to the third section. We've still got 13 minutes. Right, it's from verse 12 to verse 27. So we definitely have to go through the verses and then we'll see how much time we have left after that. And maybe we'll go through in detail something. So verse 12, Maitreya said, after hearing of his mother's uncontaminated desire for transcendental realization, the Lord thanked her within himself for her questions and thus his face smiling, he explained the path of the transcendentalists who are interested in self-realization. 13. The Personality of Godhead answered, The yoga system which relates to the Lord and the individual soul which is meant for the ultimate benefit of the living entity and which causes detachment from all happiness and distress in the material world is the highest yoga system. That's great. 14. O most pious mother, I shall now explain unto you the ancient yoga system which I explained formerly to the great sages. It is serviceable and practical in every way. 15. The stage in which the consciousness of the living entity is attracted by the three modes of material nature is called conditional life. But when that same consciousness is attached to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one is situated in the consciousness of liberation. 16. When one is completely cleansed of the impurities of lust and greed produced from the false identification with the body as I and material possessions as mine, one's mind becomes purified. In that pure state, he transcends the stage of so-called material happiness and distress. 17. At that time, the soul can see himself to be transcendental to material existence and always self-effulgent, never fragmented, although very minute in size. Verse 18. In that position of self-realization, by practice of knowledge and renunciation in devotional service, one sees everything in the right perspective. He becomes indifferent to material existence and the material influence acts less powerfully upon him. Verse 19, perfection and self-realization cannot be attained by any kind of yogi unless he engages in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead for that is the only auspicious path. Verse 20. 
every learned man knows very well that attachment for the material is the greatest entanglement of the spirit soul. But the same attachment, when applied to the self-realized devotees, opens the door of liberation. 21. The symptoms of a sadhu are that he is tolerant, merciful, and friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies. He is peaceful. He abides by the scriptures. And all his characteristics are sublime. This is a very famous verse. Verse 22. Such a sadhu engages in staunch devotional service to the Lord without deviation. For the sake of the Lord, he renounces all other connections, such as family relationships and friendly acquaintances within the world. 23. Engaged constantly in chanting and hearing about me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the sadhus do not suffer from material miseries because they're always filled with thoughts of my pastimes and activities. 24. O my mother, O virtuous lady, these are the qualities of great devotees who are free from all attachment. You must seek attachment to such holy men, for this counteracts the pernicious effects of material attachment. Pernicious means sort of, well, very bad, but even evil, <laughs> something like that. Verse 25. In the association of pure devotees, discussion of the pastimes and activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is very pleasing and satisfying to the air and the heart. By cultivating such knowledge, one gradually becomes advanced on the path of liberation, and thereafter he is freed and his attraction becomes fixed. Then real devotion and devotional service begin. This is another very famous verse. 26. Thus consciously engaged in devotional service in the association of devotees, a person gains distaste for sense gratification, both in this world and in the next, by constantly thinking about the activities of the Lord. This process of Krishna consciousness is the easiest process of mystic power. When one is actually situated on that path of devotional service, he is able to control the mind. 27. Thus, by not engaging in the service of the modes of material nature, but by developing Krishna consciousness, knowledge in, in renunciation, and by practicing yoga, in which the mind is always fixed in devotional service unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one achieves my association in this very life, for I am the Supreme Personality, the Absolute Truth. Right, so we have actually another five or six minutes. I know it's not a lot, but let's, let's try and do verse 12. So Maitreya said, after hearing of his mother's uncontaminated desire for transcendental realization, the Lord thanked her within himself for her questions. And thus, his face smiling, he explained the path of the transcendentalists who are interested in self-realization. So Srila Prabhupada begins the purport by saying, Devahuti has surrendered her confession of material entanglement and her desire, her desire to gain release. She has confessed, I'm entangled, but I want to get out. So her questions are interesting for people who are trying for liberation and who are trying to attain the perfection of human life. 
And unless you're interested in understanding spiritual life or your constitutional position, and unless you do feel inconvenience in material life, the human form is spoiled. So one who doesn't care for spiritual life, perfecting one's life, trying for liberation, one who doesn't care for these things and engages like an animal in eating, sleeping, etc., has spoiled his life. So therefore, Lord Kabila is satisfied. He's happy with his mother's questions because the answers stimulate desire for liberation from conditional life. Such questions are called apavarga vardhanam. And so then, those who actually are interested like that, those who have spiritual interest are called sat or devotees. Satam prasangat. Sat means that which exists eternally. But asat uh, means that but asat means that which is not eternal. So unless one is on the spiritual platform, one is not sat, one is asat. And asat stands on the platform which will not exist because it's temporary. It'll go, it'll be changed. But those who stand on the spiritual platform can exist eternally. So as spirit soul, actually we all do exist eternally, but those who are asat, uh, uh, those who have accepted the body to be the self, those who are asat, they've accepted the material world as their shelter, and therefore they're full of anxiety. And Prabhupada refers to asad grahan, the incompatible situation of the spirit soul who has the false idea of enjoying matter is the cause of the soul's being asat. The cause of us being in the asat condition is the incompatible situation of the soul who is situated in a material body thinks that yes, here I am, I'm here for enjoying matter. But the actual soul can't be a sat, of course. As soon as one becomes aware of this and takes to Krishna consciousness, you become sat. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Satam Gati, the path of the eternal, is very interesting to persons who are after liberation. And his Lordship Kapila began to speak about that path. So now he's going to really talk about that path for liberation. And let me just read verse 13 also, why not? The personality of God he had answered. The yoga system which relates to the Lord and the individual soul, which is meant for the ultimate benefit of the living entity, and which causes detachment from all happiness and distress in the material world is the highest yoga system. So that's what we're going to hear about now. Anyway, Prabhupada gives a purport. Here in this world, everyone's trying to get material happiness. But as soon as you get some, you get some material distress. You just don't get unadulterated happiness in this material world. You get money and you get anxiety about losing it. You get money and you spend it badly and yeah, you've got distress. So distress always contaminates. So um, Prabhupada gives an example. If you want to drink milk, you have to keep a cow and look after the cow. Drinking milk is nice, but to get milk you have to accept trouble because looking after a cow, you know, it's not a small job actually. 
So the yoga system, with this yoga system which is going to be described now by Lord Kapila, is meant to end all material happiness and distress. And of course the best system is Bhakti Yoga. So in Bhagavad Gita, it said we should be tolerant, not disturbed by happiness and distress. You know, and of course you can say that material happiness, oh, I'm not disturbed by material happiness. But the thing is, it will be followed by distress. That's, that's it. That's the law of this world. So Kap Kapila says this yoga system, which he's going to give actually, uh, is the science of the self. One practices yoga to get perfection on the spiritual platform. So eventually, Prabhupada explains, Lord Kapila will eventually explain how it is transcendental, but the preliminary introduction is given here. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.